Transport Secretary joined us now live. Very good morning to you, uh, Mr Shapps. I suppose, first of all, what was the rationale behind uh, almost decimating uh, the red list, uh, removing, what, 47 uh, countries from it? Very simple, actually. Uh, massive vaccination here and uh, now, finally, lots of vaccination elsewhere. And it's probably worth knowing that these changes we're making do apply to people who are fully vaccinated. And those are the people who will be able to come in without all the paraphernalia of multiple tests and, and the rest of it. If you are fully vaccinated, uh, you'll be able to come and go. Uh, and the PCR day two test drops right back just to a lateral flow test. So it's going to be much, much easier to travel from here and, and obviously from those countries as well. Really significant changes. Just on uh, the testing regime, uh, at the moment when you're coming back in, you need to provide a PCR test. Try, trying to follow the rules here. You need to provide a PCR test, um, even if you're fully vaccinated. That's going to change. And it's also going to change from a PCR test to a lateral flow test on day two. Is that right? That's exactly it. You have to have taken a lateral flow test by day two. Now, that actually means, in reality, you could take a, a lateral flow test as you come back in. So you could arrive uh, to Heathrow last night. You could arrive at Heathrow. Uh, you might take a lateral flow test there, see that it's negative. Um, you know, whilst you're still in the airport, that's it, you're done. Uh, or you might get home and, and take it when you get home. So um, a reasonably straightforward system, um, just that final check to make sure that people are OK, haven't picked up coronavirus, uh, and then off they go. This is going to obviously unleash the travel industry. It's been very widely welcomed by passengers, but also by uh, the operators, the airlines, the, the airports. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, Great to see such an important sector being able to get back on its feet again uh, due to these changes. Uh, but no sign that we're going to have to film ourselves taking these lateral flow tests. I think some, some in Cabinet were fighting for that, apparently. Well, no, look, we want to make this as straightforward as, as, as possible. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the simple process will be take a, a lateral flow test. Your, your viewers will be very used to them. You get the little cassette and it has the result on it. We're going to ask people to take a photo of that. And, uh, uh, and that's it, actually. It, or actually, if it's being done in person, then, then obviously you don't need to even take the photograph. I should say if it is positive, um, that would be reported by the, uh, the, the company behind the lateral flow. You will automatically then receive a PCR test on the NHS and you go into the usual NHS test and trace program where they would uh, look for you to um, take the PCR, isolate. Um, they would sequence the PCR test to see if there are any variants of concern. And so that would be the natural next stage if somebody was positive. In saying that, you, I, I take you noted this is welcome news by the industry and undoubtedly is, and we've heard from the bosses of BA and others this morning welcoming it. Uh, but at the same time, they're still not terribly happy with you and indeed the government. Uh, they feel that we almost had a missed summer by the UK being way too uh, cautious. I mean, the vaccination rates here in the UK haven't changed that dramatically uh, since uh, certainly late uh, summer. And the EU uh, were doing much of what we're now talking about in July. Well, the EU were doing lots of different things because 27 countries largely made their own decisions. Some require still, for example, tests before you can fly there. Um, uh, we don't. Um, so in that way, we're, we're, we're sort of ahead of that or, or already. It depends where it was. It is a balance. The first job of any government is to protect its population domestically. Uh, and uh, of course, the government's having to therefore weigh up uh, what were then seen as the perceived risks. You're right that we were very vaccinated. That wasn't the case in the places that we were going to uh, over the summer to quite such the, the, the same degree. The difference now is uh, much of the world has got itself vaccinated, and that's why these rules can come into place. Though, as I say, just to stress again, they do only apply to people who are themselves fully vaccinated. So if you're not, then you still have to take PCR tests. There's a day two test. There's a day eight test. There's a test to release on day five. But for fully vaccinated people, all of that drops away and it becomes very straightforward. Uh, let's move on to uh, the continuing disruption to petrol. Now, we know it's got significantly uh, better. Do you know what the latest situation is? Uh, because there is some, still some disruption, despite the intervention of the army, in parts of London and the southeast. Isn't that right? Yes. The rest of the country, uh, the situation is completely normalised. Uh, I was up in um, Manchester through the Midlands uh, the last few days. No issues at all that I could detect. In London, southeast, you're absolutely right. There have been lingering 
uh, problems. I've literally just got the latest set of data through uh, from this morning, and it shows that although it's outside of the normal range, it's actually getting very close to the normal range of supply uh, in petrol stations in London and the southeast. So we shall see those opening up over the next uh, day or two. Uh, and, you know, of course, the important thing is the army have come in and, and helped. It's important to know there's actually was never actually a shortage of fuel in the country uh, as soon as uh, people go and, 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 and queue up to, to buy it and top up cars. You end up in a situation where a bit like toilet rolls or uh, what was the other thing? Pasta at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, you, you get a sort of uh, you, you get a run on something and it's quite difficult to convince people otherwise. Uh, but there's actually always been fuel in the refineries. There's always been fuel at the uh, at the storage centers in this country. Uh, unfortunately, now we're seeing fuel in the petrol stations. To put numbers on it, uh, the amount of fuel in the petrol stations themselves is about double what it was at the low point. Um, so it, it's come back to the normal range in most parts of the country and catching up in London and the southeast now as well. Just very finely, uh, Mr. Shapps, uh, could we just talk about Newcastle and, and this Saudi takeover. Mm. Interestingly, government ministers, of course, when the, we had the whole Super League debacle, talked about the importance of uh, fans. They talked about actually <laughs> about how money shouldn't necessarily rule the game. And yet, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, they're essentially taking over Newcastle. We know they've got a terrible human rights uh, record. Is this welcome news? Well, uh, I, I suppose the big difference is this is a single club rather than an entire uh, change to an entire uh, league. It is an issue for the uh, matter for the Premier League, obviously for Newcastle United. There is a very, very clear owners and directors test which has to be passed uh, first before uh, any takeover can happen. And in this particular case, my understanding is that the business, the company, the investment has been separated off from the Saudi state itself. So it's not the state taking over the, the club. But that said, I think you're, you're right to point out that people will be very interested in this. Tracy Crouch, who's an MP, she's a former sports minister, actually, I think she's an FA coach as well, if I remember correctly, is carrying out a, uh, a review into football right now, looking at, amongst other things, the finances and the ownership patterns of clubs. So I know that she will be taking very close uh, interest in uh, what's happened in, in Newcastle. Uh, I, I also noticed the fans in this particular case uh, were um, delighted, at least those I saw on the news last night, um, that the club was moving on. But those legitimate questions will be asked and they'll be asked through that Tracy Crouch uh, football review. But, but just very, very funny, what, what it does fundamentally mean, though, is yet again more foreign ownership of Premier League clubs. And, and one of the things that I picked up during the, as I said, the Super League debacle, which the government were very animated about, was this idea of this disconnect with fans, that the that Premier League clubs were now being run by very wealthy individuals. And here we are yet again with essentially foreign ownership of yet another Premier League football club. And that disconnect... Yeah, I mean, uh, putting aside the Saudi Arabia situation aside, as a country, of course, we're, we're very open, we welcome... Uh, people investing in in Great Britain. In fact, we we attract more foreign direct investment, FDI as it's called, uh, than any other country in the world apart from the United States. We were a, a much larger uh, population. So, but this country does very well at attracting uh, inward investment. The whole Super League thing was in a different league, literally, because it was going to decimate uh, football um, here. I understand that the uh, the Newcastle United takeover actually involves a lot of gr grassroots investment um, in not just Newcastle United, but, but football in uh, Newcastle and surrounding area. And judging by the fans last night, they seem pretty chuffed about the whole thing. As I say, there are wider issues. You've rightly raised them. Uh, and Tracy Crouch will be looking at the finance and the ownership in her review itself. OK. Grand Chaps, Transport Secretary, Cabinet Minister, thank you very much indeed for joining us. <laughs>